In this video we'll talk about some of the design and evolution of various generations of combat helmets used by the United States military from World War I through the present day. We'll also discuss some of the variants in ballistic rating, uh, maybe some of the prices you can expect to pay, and places that you can um, potentially purchase a set helmet from. So starting off, World War I, the United States didn't have a combat helmet, so depending on what theater they entered. Initially, U.S. troops arriving in Europe were issued the British Mark I Brody helmet, and then those that were integrated with the French units instead were given the French M15 Adrian helmet. As you can see, a uh, completely different design than all of the helmets shown here in the video. Primarily designed for protection from ballistic or shrapnel damage from trench warfare, thus the design. Um, by the end of World War I, the U.S. finally had designed its own helmet designated as the M1917 and produced roughly 2,700,000 by the end of the war. At that point, the shortcomings of the M1917, which lacked balance and protection of the head from lateral fire, resulted in a project to produce a better helmet, which would also have a distinctly American appearance. So, going from World War I to World War II is where you start to see the development of the M1 helmet. In 1940, with World War II raging on in Europe and in Asia, it seemed like the United States would likely be at war again soon. The infantry board resurrected the quest to find a better type of helmet. Since the ongoing conflict had shown that the M1917, designed to protect men standing in trenches from falling shell splinters and shrapnel, would be inadequate on the modern battlefield, the board report reported that, quote, Research indicates that the ideal shaped helmet is one with a dome-shaped top and generally following the contour of the head, allowing sufficient uniform headspace for indentations, extending down in the front to cover the forehead without impairing necessary vision, extending down on the sides as far as possible without interfering with the use of rifle or other weapons, extending down the back of the head as far as possible without permitting the back of the neck to push the helmet forward on the head when the wearer assumes a prone position, to have the frontal plate visor, and to have the sides and rear slightly flanged outward to cause rain to clear the collar opening. So, M1 helmet is the basic design for most of the evolution of United States military helmets from World War II on to present day. Uh, the M1 helmet is a two-piece design, so you've got the outer steel pot and an inner liner. Basically, the inner liner is just kind of like a hard hat. It's got a let's call the Riddell style suspension system being based on just the present day um, football helmet suspension design. For the outer shell, outer shell is made out of a 17% manganese alloy, steel alloy. Manganese was chosen because of its high impact strength and abrasion resistance. Um, this helmet has obviously a cover on it, a cover kind of indicating the general generation that the helmet came from, most likely well post-war, um, closer to Vietnam or even post-Vietnam, which does help with the price. If you're looking to collect a World War II helmet, expect to spend a little bit more, um, but if you're looking for a helmet for just the ballistic capabilities, then if you stay away from the helmets that collectors are going for, you'll probably save a little bit of money there. Um, Fairly basic, all the little slots and the elastic band are for if you would like to attach some sort of additional foliage or camouflage to the helmet to help increase its camouflage um, capabilities. So once you take the elastic band off, take the inner shell out, you'll be able to easily take this camouflage cover off. Depending on which generation of helmet you're purchasing, the World War II era helmets were painted with cork material, and then post war helmets were painted with the silica sand material to help reduce glare when the, she when the helmets got wet so they weren't as reflective. Um, there's also a small difference between certain generation of helmets depending on where the seam is, whether it's front or back seam. The steel pot is technically what provided the majority of the ballistic protection. 
most of the weight of the helmet is based strictly in the steel pod as well. Initial testing of the helmet stated that it would be able to withstand and provide protection from a 45 ACP fired at point blank range. That's a 230 grain projectile traveling at 800 feet per second. Unofficial testing indicated capabilities of its being able to stop 32 ACP and 380 ACP as well as 8 millimeter Nambu and 9 millimeter. But that's unofficial ratings. Because of the shape of the helmet, it was also documented as having been used as other things than just ballistic protection, whether that's used as a shovel, as a hammer, as a wash basin, a bucket, a bowl, even a seat. It also had been documented to have been used as either a cooking pot to boil water or make food. However, that resulted in the metal becoming more brittle, thus reducing the ballistic capability of the helmet. For this, the liner, liner, depending on which generation of M1 helmet, they're made out of either different combinations of cotton or nylon fibers that are impregnated with resin to maintain the shape. It's basically the same kind of protection you can expect from a typical hard hat. Eventually it had evolved into a plastic liner and even modern day components of the military will use the liner component of the M1 steel helmet system. Specifically like Navy SEAL BUDS classes will use the liner. Total weight of this helmet was 2.85 pounds. They are one size fits all, which is different than the next generation of helmets. Following World War II, the M1 helmet was widely adopted or copied by numerous other countries and its distinct shape was adopted as the NATO standard. Post-war analysis of wartime casualty figures by the U.S. Army Operations Research Office found that 54% of hits to the M1 helmet failed to penetrate. An estimated 70,000 men had been saved from death or serious injury by wearing this helmet. This helmet served the United States military from 1941 until 1985 before being eventually replaced by the PASGET helmet. PASGET stands for Personnel Armor System for Ground Troops. The PASGET helmet was designed in the mid-70s but wasn't actually implemented until 1983. And then finally completely replacing the M1 across all branches by the end of the 80s, whereas the M1 served the United States military from World War II through the Korean War all the way through the end of the Vietnam War. The PASGIT is where you start to see complete usage and adoption by the United States military before the Gulf War started. Big difference in construction, whereas the M1 is a steel pot helmet with steel, the manganese steel alloy being the main primary and really the only source of ballistic protection. The PASGIT helmet now evolves into Kevlar construction. So it's 19 layers of Kevlar 29 go from a one size fits all helmet like the M1 to a five different size option, whether you're extra small, large, or extra large. Depending on which size helmet you're talking about, the weights vary between 3.1 and 4.2 pounds. So noticeably heavier than the M1, but it does provide considerably better protection. You can see there's also a big evolution in the overall shape of the helmet. It's got more protection down low near the back. Um, also a little bit of a cutout for allowing some use of um, communications equipment. The Pasket helmet is the first United States military helmet that actually adopts and is rated per DARPA, United States Marine Corps, and the U.S. Army as being an actual NIJ Level 3A ballistic protection. So it provides all the protection of the M1 plus everything listed on the Level 3 Alpha threat rating. As I said, it was designed in the mid-70s. This helmet was typically painted in an olive drab coat. It does have a little bit of texture to it to help reduce glare and reflections if the helmet gets wet. Not necessarily a spalling coating like we talked about with the body armor stuff, but I'm sure it's better at performing um, or reducing the fragmentation than if the helmet was completely smooth. Retention system and the suspension system as well are all fairly similar to the M1. 
it's just a lot more size adjustable. So this circular ring, you can adjust the tension by this Velcro in the back. So either make this circle larger to allow the webbing to sit closer to the helmet itself or make the circle smaller and then connect it to the Velcro back here, thus bringing all the webbing up closer. Also, the leather sweatband that goes around the outer ring is adjustable as well, but it is anchored at six points around the helmet that does kind of limit your adjustability in this in the sweatband portion. Um, typically, the manufacturer of the Pazgit helmets will be printed down here on the lower back right corner of the helmet. And then going from a large or even an extra large to a small, there's a considerable size difference. I don't know if you'll be able to tell on camera, but there's a pretty big size difference between the helmet on the left and the helmet on the right. They're both the same generation, they're both Pazgit helmets. Um, slightly different manufacturers, but the same overall design. From here, there's starts to get a little bit more complicated with the development of the next follow-on helmet. This helmet served technically from 1983 to present day with the United States Navy still using it aboard warships. It is still used by some SWAT teams and some portions of United Nations peacekeeping effort. However, Marine Corps and the U.S. Army and Spec Ops teams have all branched off into different variants of ballistic protection and different styles of helmets. This is where you also start to see some branching off into what's called a bump helmet, so zero ballistic protection. Really the only thing this helmet's good for is preventing like bumps and scrapes. It kind of acts more like a bike helmet, but does still give you capability for mounting NVGs. So we'll talk about bump helmets and how they differ a little bit later. Evolving from the Pazgit helmet, the first follow-on replacement was what's called the Modular Integrated Communications Helmet. It was designed in 1997. It's been used from 2001 until present day. The weight decreases slightly from 3 pounds to 3.6 pounds depending on size. It does offer 8% less coverage than the Pazgit did, but it was ideally designed to replace the Pazgit, partially to reduce weight and also to help prevent the replacement of ballistic style helmets by non-ballistic style bump helmets. The main reason for the development of the modular integrated communications helmet was due to the protective but heavy PASGIT being supplanted by the bump style helmets by special forces operators due to them being lighter, more comfortable, closer fitting, and made of plastic thus making them easier to mount accessories to, especially night vision devices and comms headsets. The lighter weight and non-ballistic nature of these helmets allowed the fitting of additional accessories without putting undue strain on the neck or requiring drilling of holes for the Kevlar to fix night vision mounting brackets, which would thus compromise Kevlar's ability to protect if not done precisely. Inevitably, operators suffered injury and deaths due to taking their wholly unsuited plastic helmet into the unforgiving environment of close quarters warfare, especially in the 1993 Battle of Mogadishu, where at least one Delta Force operator was supposedly killed by a rifle shot to the head. You can tell from the pictures that this next helmet is a little bit different shape, primarily cutting off this front brim of the helmet primary reason for that is, yes, it does provide less protection specifically from rounds coming down or shrapnel fragmentation coming down. It also does not interfere with the mounting of night vision goggles, night vision devices. The MICH helmet does have a slightly different retention system, which is more similar to the cushions and straps found on bicycle and skateboard helmets. This change provides greater impact retention and comfort for the wearer. It can be fitted with a mounting bracket for night vision device on the front, since it doesn't have that front lip. You'll typically see more use of varied pattern designs, whether that's M81 Woodland, USMC Marpat, US Army UCP, or the Cry Multicam. Also, just solid black use for SWAT teams. Among numerous other patterns available commercially, 
as with the Pazgit, it's often worn with a band around it which features a pair of cat eye patches, um, some sort of IRR reflective material to help reduce friendly fire incidents. Because of the higher cut of the MICH helmet, it does provide better situational awareness and less obstruction to the user's vision. The United States Marine Corps evaluated this helmet during the search for its own replacement for the Pazgate helmet, but instead chose to adopt a helmet that retains the same profile of the Pazgate but is just lighter. This helmet's known as the lightweight helmet. Because it still has the same overall design as the Pazgate, it does still get the same nickname of the K pot because it references more of that World War II era steel helmet used by um, Germany, the Stahlhelm. As you can see, very similar profile. Got the lip on the front. The lightweight helmet is also known as the lightweight Marine Corps helmet or the lightweight Marine helmet. It's used by both the United States Marine Corps and the U.S. Navy. It was designed in 2003 and has been used from 2003 until now. It's larger but actually lighter than the Pazgate helmet. The same four point retention strap um, as the MICH helmet. Weight is approximately 3.2 pounds. Now whereas the Pazgate helmet is in olive drab green, the lightweight helmet is painted in coyote brown. Also, whereas it's heavier than the United States Army's Advanced Combat Helmet, its larger size offers more protection, but is lighter than the Pazgit. The lightweight helmet lasted the Marine Corps in combat use at least from 2003 until 2013, where they placed the first order for their Enhanced Combat Helmet, and it's continuing to be used by the Marine Corps in non-combat and training purposes. So, speaking of the Advanced Combat Helmet, Let's wear at the Modular Integrated Comms Helmet, the Marine Corps and the Army diverged on their follow-on successor. The Advanced Combat Helmet was just like the Lightweight Helmet, also designed in 2003. It's also made of Kevlar, just like the Lightweight Helmet is. It uses Kevlar 129 as opposed to Kevlar 29 in the Pazgit, and it also uses Toyron. However, it's slightly lighter than the Pazgit at 2.4 pounds. You can tell from the pictures there's a pretty big difference in the shape between the Advanced Combat Helmet and the Pazgit or even the Lightweight Helmet. Specifically the front brow is eliminated to improve upward visibility and allow easier mounting of night vision goggle brackets. The side brim has also been raised to the point the entire lower brim of the helmet is flat compared to the Pazgit which curves upward at the back. This also allows greater c compatibility with communication heads headsets and improve hearing when headsets are not used. Now the Enhanced Combat Helmet was designed in conjunction between the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army to replace the current combat helmets used by both the Army, the Navy, and Marine Corps, although similar in shape to the Advanced Combat Helmet and its predecessor before that, the MICH. The Enhanced Combat Helmet is instead constructed using thermoplastics instead of ballistic fibers that were used on all the previous generation helmets. So the same type of material used in the polyethylene plates that we talked about in the previous video is what's used in this new generation of helmets, the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene material. Whereas Kevlar is designed to catch a bullet, the polyethylene is designed to slow the bullet down and kind of melt around it. The Enhanced Combat Helmet started development in 2007 it's identical in shape to the Advanced Combat Helmet, but it's thicker, but lighter material. This results in a 35% better performance than the Advanced Combat Helmet at dealing with small arms and fragmentation damage, as well as certain rifle projectiles. It's a tactical cut, so it provides less coverage, but more overall mob mobility. And this helmet was designed in 2007. It started service in 2012, and is currently being used by the United States Marine Corps. The weight is down to 3.3 pounds. The Enhanced Combat Helmet has a four-point chin strap, nape strap, head retention system. The United States Marine Corps uses this helmet as well as limited use by the United States Army. Additionally, similar helmets or evolutions of this helmet specifically are used by Green Beret Navy SEALs and other Spec Ops forces. Specifically, the FAST or the Future Assault Shell Technology Helmet Fast Helmet offers a 25% reduction in weight 
these fast helmets where you start seeing different variants, whether that's ballistic or non-ballistic. Ballistic being the same type of helmet we've been talking about where it offers level 3 alpha or better protection from ballistic threats, but also non-ballistic versions of the bump helmet where it's more for bumps and scrapes as opposed to protection from projectiles and fragmentation. Due to further advancements of the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene material, but more specifically because of the complete different shape and reduction in protection, there's a big difference in weight between the enhanced combat helmet and the fast helmet. Since these future salt shell technology helmets cover both ballistic and non-ballistic variants, the weights vary from all the way down at 0.69 pounds to 2.28 pounds. And if the advanced and enhanced combat helmets both more closely match the overall shape of the Pasket helmet, you can see there's a huge difference between that and the future salt shell technology helmet. There's a much bigger cutout here on the side for comms. You can tell there's a much bigger cutout for an earpiece, an ear cup. The rear is different, the front is different, it's narrower, it's closer cut. If you don't need to provide for back face def deformation, the helmet doesn't need to be as big around the shape of the wearer's head. So part of the weight savings is just in less material. The newer generation of helmet, the more likely you're going to have some sort of mounting rail. A lot of times primary use for a bump helmet in addition to small bumps and scrapes and bruises. Protection from that is just a efficient way of mounting NVGs. So if you're not expecting any sort of ballistic threat but you need to wear goggles, this is the most comfortable way of doing it. NVGs on the front and a counterweighted battery pack on the back. You can also add things like lights, cameras, other IR equipment, communication equipment, um, to the side rails. For a quick recap on the ballistic capabilities of each of the helmets, starting from the M1917, not at all designed for any sort of lateral impact, uh, specifically only designed for from above fragmentation or shrapnel damage from trench warfare. Moving on to the M1, a little bit of protection from lateral impacts, specifically and officially rated for a 45 fired from something like a 1911, um, but still primarily designed for fragmentation and shrapnel damage. Then moving on to the Pazgit helmet, 19 layers of Kevlar. Level 3 Alpha threat as per rated by DARPA, United States Marine Corps and the US Army because of its Kevlar 29, 19 layers of Kevlar 29. Moving from that to the Modular Integrated Communications Helmet, the same ballistics rating, just slightly less coverage because of a smaller cut in helmet design. Moving up from the MICH helmet to the lightweight helmet, back to the Pazgit design and shape, so more overall protection, lighter weight, and better protection than the Advanced Combat Helmet. Advanced Combat Helmet still made out of Kevlar, Slightly different generation of Kevlar, Kevlar 129 versus Kevlar 29 in addition of Toyron hybrid synthetic fibers. The weight decreases, but the same overall level 3 alpha protection. Enhanced combat helmet is where you move up to the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. As stated previously, 35% better protection than the advanced combat helmet at small arms and fragmentation damage, as well as certain rifle projectiles. They're not officially moving up to the next level rating, specifically because you'll have a hard time finding a helmet that does better or is rated better than level 3 alpha because even if the helmet can withstand bigger pistol, faster moving pistol, or even rifle rounds, your head and neck are likely not going to be able to withstand that set or sort of impact damage. Um, just like the head doesn't do well, neck doesn't do well in a rear impact crash, like car crash. Um, the type of energy that you would see transferred from a projectile moving at supersonic speeds fired out of a rifle barrel transitioning to a helmet is not going to go well for your head and neck. For the future assault shell technology helmet, you're cutting weight significantly also for the non-ballistic 
whether it's made out of plastic, polymer, or carbon fiber, zero ballistic protection, maybe some small protection from uh, small fragmentation or shrapnel, but definitely nothing from any sort of projectile. Um, for the ballistic versions of the fast helmet, you will have the same level 3 alpha, just less overall coverage because of the cut of the helmet. So the prices can get a little bit complicated too because depending on who you're buying it from, the prices will vary wildly. There's all sorts of different levels of quality and options and accessories. But for the most part, as far as purchasing new, unused, fairly newer generation combat style ballistic helmets, you can buy things like the MICH style Kevlar helmets from companies like Hardhead Veterans at hardheadveterans.com for roughly $400. From there you can go on to the advanced combat helmet style from companies like AR500 for around $400 as well. Still Kevlar technology. There are companies that sell without a ballistic warranty, quote unquote, real deal. Um, military contract helmets for a much lower price, but you're obviously risking the protection capability of buying a company that's backing their product. Um, but you can expect to see prices on those non-ballistic warranty helmets ranging from $189 to $325. Or the fast style helmets, you can see prices range between $450 to $620. Once again, Hardhead Veterans does a Kevlar version of a fast helmet for $500. Team Wendy is more of a luxury brand. They've got different sorts of helmets, both bump style and ballistic style protection helmets. Most of their stuff is the newest generation fast style high cut um, for increasing your capabilities with uh, communication equipment, but some of the prices you can expect to see from them if you're getting their ballistic hybrid composite helmet $1,175 for their um, kind of bottom tier ballistic helmet and if you're getting their full composite lighter weight top tier helmet expect to spend $1,545 these are all US prices and this is all in August of 2021 um, but these are the prices listed on their website at least if you'd like to get their bump helmets they can still be more expensive than what you could pay otherwise um, from other retailers but They've got a polymer, polymer helmet of the bump style variety for $302 and a carbon fiber bump helmet for $600. Um, you can expect to get a decent quality bump helmet for close to $70. You don't have to spend hundreds of dollars like that if it's not providing you any sort of ballistic protection anyways. As you can see, these helmets are all pretty expensive regardless of which technology you go for, which generation you go for. So, if you're on a budget, um, there are obviously online retailers like eBay where you may or may not be 100% um, certain as to the quality or authenticity of the helmet that you're paying for but if you go to like a military surplus army navy surplus store um, you can get usually a better price on surplus helmets it's going to be hard to find any of the current generation stuff because it's obviously being used by the military but the previous generation stuff is usually fairly easy to come by so you can find Pazgit helmets for between $125, maybe $150. Um, you can find the next generation, so the advanced combat and maybe enhanced combat helmet, most likely just the advanced combat helmet, the lightweight helmets, kind of just the second generation of the Pazgit stuff for closer to $250. And then if you'd like to um, be on an even tighter budget, the M1 style helmet. So you can usually find these. These are at a huge surplus. As long as you're not getting the really old, highly collectible World War II era stuff, where you're spending a couple hundred dollars on a good quality version of that, you can get the post-war Vietnam era M1 style helmets for less than $100 usually. It just obviously doesn't offer as good a protection as the newer generation Kevlar even. Ultra high molecular weight polyethylene helmets. Um, I'll try to include a couple links to some of these retailers and some of the prices um, and some additional information in the description. Let me know if you have any questions.